Ladies and gentlemen, joining Michael Robinette on stage, please welcome back John McElroy and Glenn Stevens. Thanks, Mike. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to wrap things up pretty quick here, and then we've got a, a little treat a video at the end uh, for people to take a look at. Um, but I want to call you guys the bookends today. John, you kicked it off, set the tone great today, and Mike, thank you. If, if you didn't get the industry in that TED Talk in, in real summary, <laughs> you missed it, so thank you for doing that. Um, first thoughts, real quick, on the governor's announcement, what that means, what, you know, and you've worked a little bit with the administration. Thoughts, Mike? <clears throat> it's long in coming. I think it's, I think it's critically important. We do a lot of work with not only the state, but other jurisdictions around the world. And I, and I think it's really important to set a tone, set a tone of this is the direction we want to go. And we've got a person that's going to, and a person and a lot of resources behind it to help bring it to, to, to bear. So I think it's really critical. Yeah, I would just echo exactly what Mike said. You know, it's great to see this coming. Good. So Mike, John and I were joking backstage, like you're listening to somebody speak and you change the questions in your mind. Uh, I've known you guys for a couple of years. Um, you see the industry, I mean, you've seen it for many years. You've seen it change, you've seen it evolve. But let me put it in, in terms of a word you used, mix. And let's talk about Michigan in our mix, you know, because our mix has to change and it's changing. And how do we align talent and what suppliers are going to make versus what they used to make? And how does the mix change here? And, and, is it, and I think Sandy talked about culture and mindset, and I think Darren did too today. I think it's critical. I mean, there's mix on two levels. There's mix from an R&D perspective. Who and what are we designing for the future of the industry? I think that obviously is important. And then who are we building vehicles and components for? Well, I think we all know uh, the D3 are, are absolutely predominant in Michigan and, and in most, of, most around Michigan as well. So that's, that's really our bread and butter. But from an R&D perspective, having you know, over 20 OEMs here, there's a reason why they're here. And I think that's going to be a real key going forward. John, Tom. Yeah, what I would say is we've got tremendous assets in the state, automotive assets, the R&D, the, the manufacturing capability. We mentioned the D3 all the time. Don't forget Toyota's got a massive organization here. We've got Nissan, we've got Hyundai Kia as well. We've got all the major tier one suppliers in the world who are here. But the industry still has not that great of a, a perceived perception. You know, uh, you, you talk to people and it's still, it, it's those dirty factories and it's a rust belt industry and it's not as up to date. We need to shatter that myth. And one of my pet peeves is the automakers spend billions of dollars of advertising every single year to move the metal. They do nothing to promote their own corporate image, and nobody does anything to promote the image of the industry. And then we scratch our heads and go, wow, why can't we get young people to come to this industry? We do nothing to tell them of what's really cool and going on. They know what Elon's doing, and they all want to run there or to the Valley for other companies. How do we change that around and make it like we had here 120 years ago? And I believe that that's that we're capable of achieving that. But the first thing that we gotta go out and start uh, evangelizing on is the cool stuff that we've got right here, right now. Do you think we have an opportunity, Mike and, and John, with, with regards to building a perception campaign, changing, you know, it could be social media based, I mean, very organic. Should we be doing something as an industry as we, I mean, we, we know talent's an issue. We talk about that ad nauseum. Uh, what, what should we do? I, I'm not saying it's a course correction because obviously the state and the industry is known for a while that we've got a talent perception and also a geographic perception. You know, you go somewhere else and you say you're from Detroit and they, they have this older ver vision of what Detroit is and then you tell them about the restaurants and you tell them about the, the, the fact you can't find a condo and, and, the, and you start to, and then they, their perception changes. I think, I think certainly it's going to take a while, but as we start to get newer product on the road, whether it be autonomous or whether it be electrified or the combination thereof, they're going to start to really see that, where did that come from? Well, a lot of that development occurred in Michigan, and I think that's going to be critical. I think we need to look into the past and see what we used to do. So, for example, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, General Motors would send out this 
this caravan of very sleek looking trucks, very modern, very art deco and streamlined. They called it the parade of progress. This is before television had really caught on. And these trucks would go all through the country and they'd have all, and by design, good looking single college men who would explain all these great things that General Motors was doing. And it was not trying to sell Chevys and Pontiacs and Oldsmobiles or anything like that. It, these trucks were jam-packed full of the technology that was research that GM was doing. A lot of it having nothing to do with the auto industry. But they created this perception that, holy moly, GM's got all these young people working for the company, working on bleeding edge technology. Ford Motor Company, uh, after the 1939 World's Fair in Chicago, disassembled its exhibit there and rebuilt it in Dearborn. They called it the Rotunda. And I remember being there as a little, little kid, literally five years old, and going into that place. And Ford had hired Disney in the 50s to create these dioramas and animatronics. And I remember one room in particular was called the City of Tomorrow. And you go in, and there's this big city, and there's autonomous cars and flying vehicles going all around. And again, your perception was, wow, Ford is so cool. They're, they're getting us ready to go into the next century. In the 1950s, it was the fourth highest popular tourist destination in the United States. Number one was the Statue of Liberty. Number two was the Golden Gate Bridge. Number three was the Grand Canyon. Canyon. Number four was the Ford Rotunda. We used to do things that promoted us, us being the Detroit metro area and our automotive as being absolutely bleeding edge. We don't do anything like that anymore. Yeah, Mike. No, I, 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 I agree, to be honest with you. I, I, I think we, we need to do a better job. Uh, I feel like I've done my part. I have two sons that are in the automotive industry, so maybe some of you need to do your part. Uh, but but uh, nonetheless, I think it's critical. Well, I think we're, we're preaching to the choir a little bit with the room here today. Um, one of the things we know from some of the perception work we've done at Miss Auto is there's a gap uh, between whether or not young people or people in general think that the vehicle is high-tech, global in a growth oriented, you know, high tech, you know, consumer product. I mean, if you saw Darren Palmer today, I mean, you couldn't miss that. They put a lot of thought. I mean, what are your thoughts about the Ford Mach-E? Um, I think certainly Ford needed it. If you think about it, what's the last electric vehicle that they did? And it was, it was basically the Focus Electric and it was, it was basically from a supplier. So uh, they, they needed to do this. Um, I, I do like the fact that they've kind of, uh, kept the volume expectations kind of modest to, so that we're not all, all kind of rattling the cage and saying, where's the two or 250,000 units a year? I think that, uh, you know, John and I were talking about this off stage, but you know, the real difference is gonna be mild as we get into that whole hybridization. That's where the real volume is gonna be, but you do need to be there at the end uh, to, you know, from a performance perspective, but also to kind of stake your, your pole, like, uh, like the North Pole. You, you really need to kind of stake your area and say, I can do it, but I'm also gonna be spending a lot of time on the journey on the way there. Yeah, I would say I really like Ford's strategy. I like that they called it a Mustang. I know this has created great grief amongst Mustang enthusiasts. Nonetheless, Ford needed to do something that just broke out of the clutter sort of like Tesla's achieved. They haven't quite gotten that, at least not yet, but it made headlines around the world that they were doing a Mustang EV. Yeah. Same reason why GM is bringing back the Hummer brand. You know, they broke out of the clutter. It had headlines around the world. The other thing that I like about uh, the Ford Mach-E program is, you know, they had started with a compliance vehicle. They were a year into that, when finally the CEO said, what are we doing here, the new CEO? We're not gonna make any money on this, nobody's gonna want it. So they had to literally throw a year's worth of work in the garbage can and start all over. And they started using that customer-centric design process that Darren talked about. I, I'm as impressed by the process by which Ford developed the mach -E as I am in the vehicle itself. And you know, if that's indicative of what Ford's going to be able to do in the future, it, it's going to be a far more competitive company. Well, speaking of indicative, we've seen coming out, well, actually the last 10 years, a lot of different management and a lot of different leadership 
than we saw in the decades before. And when it comes to issues that are important, you know, for example, diversity and inclusion today, and, and it was mentioned very clearly that that either comes from the top um, and, and from the troops, or it doesn't work and it's not relevant and it's not impactful. But, you know, what are your thoughts on, we saw the governor today, that's leadership. What are your thoughts on the leaders that we have and the companies that are based here or the suppliers that are based here and, and, and how they're going to be able to manage this disruption and keep adapting? Do you see different leadership? Um, oh, I think there's no doubt. I mean, you take a look at the, the leaders that we had um, even, even last decade versus, let's say, what we see from, from Mary Barra or what we see from people like, like Mike Manley and, and even over at Ford, different styles. I mean, no, none of the three have the same style. Uh, and, and so, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of disruption. Um, you know, those, those manufacturers are going to look completely different in 10 years, not only from, well, they build different types of vehicles, but the, their value equation, how they develop vehicles, who develops them, how they work with their suppliers, and all, and all of the other factors, disruptors we talked about, is going to monumentally change these companies. So really, you need leaders who are able to adapt and, and prosper in, in a change environment. Yeah, look, if you look at the leadership that the domestic industry had prior to the Great Recession, they were managing an unmanageable situation. They had gotten uh, to the point where their legacy costs had handcuffed the company. I'm talking pension, health care, the jobs bank, work rules, and the like. It was cheaper for them to make a car yeah. than not make a car. That's how out of whack things had gotten with the jobs bank and, and things like that. And that's when target pricing really came to the fore. That is, they would look at a segment and say, okay, this is what people are really paying for a car. So that's what we got to sell the car for. And we want to make this profit margin. So what's left over is what we have to hit from a cost standpoint. Every nut, bolt, and washer had a price tag on it, and they had to hit that. And it didn't matter if the competition spent a little bit more money, had a nicer interior, maybe a little bit more advanced technology. They had to go to this target pricing, which, by the way, they still use. But the point I'm getting at is the leadership then had a different set of issues it had to deal with. The, the Great Recession, the bankruptcies, forward borrowing and, and getting out of it changed the dynamic. We've seen some companies react a whole lot better to that new dynamic than others. You know, what you really have to question, though, uh, is would we have seen some of what we we're seeing, like a Mary Barra being promoted to CEO? That was done by an outsider who was yeah, brought was. in. Yeah. Would that have ever happened under the old regime? I highly doubt it. Yeah. So in some cases, disruptions like that can be extremely beneficial. I'm not praying for another one, believe me. But we were able to get rid of all the legacy costs. Look at the city of Detroit, you know, with the, the grand bargain and how so many disparate areas of the state came together to help the city. You know, uh, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. I think we're going to go through in this day, decade a slow rolling crisis, you know, and I tried to talk about that in, in my initial remarks, that we're going to see enormous upheaval in the industry. And the ones who are agile, adaptive, and open to new ideas will probably thrive. And those who maybe, I'm not going to say are dragging their heels, but are not as agile, not as adaptive, not as, as open to, they're the ones that are going to be in trouble. It's going to boil down to a mindset. I mean, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, we talk about this all the time. And if you look back at the history of Michigan, we've hit multiple inflection points the gas crisis, the Japanese first coming here to build and sell cars. And we said, ah, OK, we're just going to keep doing our thing. And then more came. Then the final big one was this, not, not hopefully the final one like it was, the, the financial meltdown. You can't force your way through an inflection point. You either figure out how to go up or you take the downward. And I, I, I sense there's a different mentality here. but. You know, we've, talk, we've talked a lot about the OEMs and the big tiers. The backbones of our communities across Michigan are the small companies. Yes, and, and to be honest with you, 
that's where I've got the biggest pause these days. I, 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 we do a lot of work with mid-sized suppliers. I'm not saying it's the only, uh, only entity that we work with, but, but that seems to be a bit of a specialty for us. And I will tell you, uh, a lot of them are family-run companies. They, they're on second or third generation leadership, and they're looking out saying, wow, I, I don't have the R&D path to go where my sector probably should go. Um, I don't have the right people. Um, I'm probably either too small or I'm not global or I don't have, there's some boxes I'm not ticking. And I can tell you that private equity is standing back and they, some of them are smelling blood and they think that there's going to be some consolidation occurring. Not across the board, but they're in select areas where there's six or seven regional players it might not make sense to be that many. So again, there's going to be a lot of fallout. I completely agree. One other thing I'd like to add here is we need to be thinking as a country about the importance of the auto industry and how we keep what we've got. And th there's a fine balance here between uh, a national policy that you know keeps out competitors and all that and protects something that can grow to be fat and lazy and yet we are competing against countries that have got industrial policies that are taking jobs away from us you know uh, I, I don't agree with a whole lot with the Trump administration but I do agree with its moves to raise tariffs with China because there's no way that we have the ability to compete against state-subsidized uh, companies that have much easier access to capital and have got targeted R&D being poured into them. Uh, I, like I said, it's a fine balance. We, we don't want to copy that, but we need to have at least a strategy that says this industry is so important to the economy we're going to have to do things that make sure that it's on more of a late, uh, level playing field. Right. Well, I mean, that's why we're here today. And oh, I forgot everybody else was still here today. Sorry. <laughs> Talking to you guys, I could do it all day long. But, you know, the, the question is, is are we going to do the things that we need to do that are tough, that are difficult? Uh, whether it be on infrastructure types of things or on talent types of things, because doing th things the same way is not going to work for us. So that's why we kind of built the conversation the way we did today. Um, I'll wrap this up here, and, and first of all, thank both of you guys for being here. Mike, thanks for, for thanks, bookending Glenn. it. Yep. John, thanks for the day uh, today, and uh, I know how much passion and work you guys both put into things. So can we uh, give these guys a round of applause? Yeah. So what I'd like to do is wrap it up and just kind of share a couple things that are coming up, um, just to tie things up. We are still going to be busy as a Mish Auto team. Uh, most importantly for us coming up in April is we're going to take the industry to Lansing. Uh, it's continuously important for us to educate our legislators and communicate with them. We're then going to be uh, at our auto on the island. But even though there's a little snow coming, I heard, it won't be June uh, for, for in, in, in too long from now. We're all going to be focused on, you know, really what's a tipping point event for our industry here in Michigan is this evolution of the auto show, right? Um, we've talked about it a lot. There's a lot of, you know, what's going to happen. I can tell you that Rod and the team are really putting a lot of work into it. So what we're going to wrap up today is a little video just to show you a little bit how they're thinking differently and, and what we can expect in June. And thanks, everybody, for being here today.